My Aunt Maureen was a badass. She had plenty of piercings and a tattoo of Dracula on her arm. She owned medieval weapons and a lot of animals throughout her life, including, no joke, fruit bats. She also owned a lot of schlocky 80s novels and a large collection of horrors on VHS. As a kid, I used to marvel at the covers and the provocative blurbs of movies like The Blob and Watchers and The Thing and every similar artefact on her shelves. I am so grateful to 2017 for giving me something which reminded me of her. The Void is just awesome. A violent, visceral and intense horror she would have loved. The insistence on practical effects was glorious and the cast of unknowns were on point. It also had an impressively ambiguous ending which genuinely plays to that overused and much abused description of Lovecraftian. I adored 2015's It Follows because of how it played with my mind. I adore The Void because of how it played with my nerves and gag reflex. In fact, the only way I could love this film more was if it featured scan lines and I'd had to adjust the tracking before watching it. You may have noticed the conspicuous lack of superhero films on this list so far, which is surprising because the MCU continues to dominate. Thor Ragnarok was a blast and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 strokes so many of my popcorn G-spots. But because of its interconnected nature, I wanted the MCU to put its best foot forward this year. And that foot took one hell of a step. Homecoming ranks as one of the greatest superhero films of all time. Hell, take out the Lycra and Flying Metal Men and it would rank pretty highly as a coming-of-age teen flick. This film did almost everything right. In fact, it's one of the few films I've ever sat through wishing it would go on longer. Tom Holland is the best Peter Parker, and Michael Keaton has never been better. And yes, I have taken his Oscar nomination into account. One thing I really loved about Homecoming was how bold it was. Some people have complained about Uncle Ben's absence from the MCU, but playing to this hole in the mythology actually increased my empathy with Peter and May as characters. His absence is almost as conspicuous to us as it must be for them. A new love interest and the whole MJ thing also show that Marvel isn't afraid to bring something new to the table. I have this niggling fear that the MCU will start running out of steam in 2018, but if it does begin to decline, at least it will be coming in from an incredible height. My friend Graham Swanson of 50 Words for Film recommended this one to me. How well you know me, old friend. This is the other coming-of-age story on the list. However, the focus is less on great power and great responsibility, and more on sexual awakening and demented acts of ferocious cannibalism. Raw is fucking deranged, even by French standards. It certainly holds your attention, and is one of the few films which ups the ante with each successive scene. Seriously, I sat there blinking and twitching in anticipation of what fresh insanity would be served in the next course. I've seen Raw described as a cross between Suspiria and Ginger Snaps. This is a great comparison, because it crosses Argento's stylized mania with the latter's entertaining, dark, yet sympathetic study of our most savage instincts. Alice Lowe is one of the great unsung heroes of British comedy. If you do recognise her, it's probably from her turn as token woman Liz Asher in Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, one of the best cult series of all time. But while several of her co-stars went on to greater recognition, she's always seemed content to busy herself on the outer limits of pop culture. In 2017, Lowe thrust herself out of the shadows in an epic fashion. Prevenge is one of the best British films ever made. It's an original and powerfully atmospheric slasher film with some of the pitchest black humour you will ever find. Let me put it this way. I could never have imagined that I would ever chuckle at the sight of a pregnant woman getting punched in the face. Lowe owns every aspect of this film. As director, writer and lead, she ties the whole thing together with incredible confidence. It has a potent score 
And towards the end, it turns the city of Cardiff into an almost dreamlike city of lights. The perfect stage for expectant Mother Ruth's surreal quest for vengeance. It's difficult to anticipate where she goes from here as a filmmaker, but I am begging you, Miss Lowe, please, please keep making movies. We're back in La La Land territory here. I recognise Get Out's brilliance as a work of cinema and social commentary, but we just didn't gel. I love Aronofsky. Requiem for a Dream is in my top 10 of all time, and his talent remains undeniable. Mother is probably my least favourite of his films, but it's still an inspired avalanche of batshit insanity. I actually enjoyed Prometheus, but I hate everything it's done to the Alien universe. But I did love Covenant's insights into how you build better worlds, and Catherine Waterston was a great lead. And Michael Fassbender topped his moustache twirling, dick dastardly like performance as David by also playing Walter, one of the most likeable and fascinating artificial persons ever brought to the screen. I'm lumping these two together because they share a subgenre and themes, and they weren't quite as awful as I thought they'd be. They were boring and kind of useless, but I can't in all honesty call them bad. This was the worst film I saw in 2017. But that's more to do with how high the bar was set. I haven't seen it. I mentioned It Follows earlier. It's pretty relevant in this context because it was my pick for best film of 2015. And also, I saw it in February of that year and it had to see off 10 months of competition. My number one came out in March, but yeah... Same principle. I I had a lot of trepidation about this one because X-23 is one of my favourite fictional characters and I didn't want to see her dishonoured. This was a deal breaker for me. But James Mangold and Daphne Keane not only brought Laura to the screen superbly, they did so while distinguishing her from every other representation we've seen. And Logan provided so many other wonders. Hugh Jackman gave a career best performance, and both he and Patrick Stewart clearly relished exploring new aspects of characters that they'd begun to wear like slippers. Boyd Holbrook was a great villain, which helped because Richard E. Grant really wasn't. But he wasn't a drag on the ticket either, and it was delightful to see Eric LaSalle, who shined during his brief contribution. Kind of special. Logan plays to one of the things that I, as a sometime X-Men fanatic, love about the series. The focus on extraordinary people at odds with a world which fears and hates them. But it also concerns itself with themes of regret and frailty and exhaustion and redemption without feeling overwrought. And so, 2017, the year we learned how profound and emotionally stirring a film about a stabby man with a metal skeleton could be.